Well, hello everybody. Um, I'm Stephen Reicher, uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, the nature of toxic leadership. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm not with you here today. Um, I would very much like to have been here um, in Montreal. Uh, it would have been a pleasure to talk to you and discuss with you, uh, to meet old friends and to see Montreal, which I'm told is a beautiful city, uh, but which I've never visited before. So perhaps uh, on a future occasion. So let me start. If we talk about toxic leadership, it's probably best to start by acknowledging that we live in relatively toxic times. Uh, often, if you blinked, you'd think we might be back in the 1930s with trade wars uh, starting, with walls and borders rising, with the global resurgence of uh, extreme forms of nationalism. But if there's one phenomenon above all which I think concerns us and which is reminiscent of the past, it is this. Wherever you go in the world today, whether you look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, Modi in India, Putin in Russia, Duterte in the Philippines, Vukic in Serbia, Erdogan in Turkey, we see the rise of the strong man, the authoritarian leader, the toxic leader. But if there is one individual above all who seems to exemplify this tendency, one figure above all who dominates our world, our imaginations and our concerns, it is, of course, this man, Donald Trump. And what I'm going to try and do today is to outline some general principles of leadership to understand the process of toxic leadership and then illustrate that with Donald Trump, with trying to understand how this man, so flawed in so many ways, so misogynist, so racist, so narcissistic and uncontrolled, could be elected to the office of the presidency of the United States. So let me start. If we are to understand toxic leadership, we need to start by understanding leadership. And I want to argue that if we want to understand leadership, we need to understand by under, uh, start by understanding groups. Because the history of research into leadership is one, in a sense, of broadening our gaze, of understanding that leadership is not just about leaders. For many years, we tried to find the individual characteristics which marked people out as skillful, effective leaders. And that's still going on, but it's still an enterprise marked more by uh, its roadblocks than by its progress. Then we made the obvious understanding, the obvious extension that leadership is a social relationship. It's a relationship between leaders and followers, and we need to understand that relationship. But most contemporary theories of leadership try to address the relationship between leaders and followers and the ways in which it makes leaders effective. And I want to argue, however, we need to take one further step. We need to broaden our focus still further and to understand that leadership is a relationship between leaders and followers within the social group. Because a leader is always a leader of a group, a leader of a nation, a leader of a religion, a leader of a political party. And the leaders of groups that are not our own have no hold over us. Often we look at them and count it bizarre that people should support them. We can't understand it. So to understand leadership, we need to in, under, uh, include not only followers, but the social group. We need, as I said, to understand leadership as a relationship between leaders and followers in the social group. And that's why, if we want to understand leadership, we need to understand something about group process. Now, let me illustrate something about group psychology with an experience which I think is particularly British, but you might have experienced it in other countries as well. You get on a crowded train. You're packed in with other people. You're part of a physical crowd, but psychologically you're separate. You're distant from everybody else. 
you feel you have nothing in common with them. Their, their presence is an impediment. Their proximity is unpleasant. If they stare over your shoulder to read the same free newspaper that they're reading, then you count that as an intrusion. If they touch you or rub against you, that is profoundly disturbing. And then the train starts and the train goes along and at some point it judges to a halt and it stays stopped. And after a while there is an announcement to explain why the train has stopped, what's gone wrong. And at that point something happens. Because now you're not just separate individuals, you are commuters who have in common an experience of being badly served, badly treated by the train company. You begin to form a psychological group. You begin to have a shared identity. And people begin to turn to each other. They begin to talk to each other. They might even begin to share their sandwiches. And in Britain, at least, that's a fairly extreme form of sociability. Now, we have data uh, experimentally as well as anecdotally to make these points. But I use this example to illustrate the difference between a physical group and a psychological group. A set of people who might be together physically but are psychologically separate and a set of people who see themselves as members of a social group. And when that happens, there are a number of transformations, as I've alluded to. But let me be more specific and point to three transformations in particular. First of all, there is a cognitive transformation. You stop thinking of yourself as an individual, but as a group member. You stop behaving in terms of individual norms and values and beliefs, and you begin to take on the norms and values of the group. If you go into a church, you take on the norms and values of your religion. If you go to a political rally, you take the norms and values of your political party, and so on. And above all, what changes is your notion of interest. Now, the interest is not your individual interest and opposed to those of other people. It becomes the collective interest, and their interest is part of your own. If you're watching a game of football, I probably should say soccer, uh, to this audience, but football, and a goal is scored, you didn't score that goal, you didn't kick that ball into the net, you did nothing, but you still feel exhilarated because the interest of the group has been served. So again, there is a cognitive transformation such that people begin to think and to evaluate things in terms of the norms, the values, the interests of the group. But it isn't just that there's a cognitive transformation. The second transformation is relational. People who are other stop being other. They stop being, if you like, separate to you. They become part of an extended identity. And that leads to a whole series of changes in the way you relate to people. There is a relational transformation. The work of Tom Tyler has shown how we trust and respect and cooperate with fellow in-group members. Our own research has shown, for instance, how we help in-group members that if they are in need, we are more likely to give our time and give our num uh, money to, to help them. We've shown even some fairly fundamental shifts. So, for instance, if you ask people to arrange chairs as if they're about to have a conversation, and you tell them they're either going to be talking to an in-group member or an out-group member, they arrange the chairs about 20% closer for the in-group member. Physical proximity is seen as more positive. People want to be crowded with in-group members, even as they find it aversive to be crowded with out-group members. And even emotionally, even in terms of a basic emotion like disgust, something which normally keeps us distant from other people, we find that with in-group members, disgust, and not just moral disgust, but physical embodied disgust, changes. So, for instance, if you're asked to smell a sweaty t-shirt, a disgusting sm uh, smelly t-shirt that is either the logo of your in-group, your own university, or the out-group, another university on it, then people find it less disgusting if it's in-group. Uh, they walk more slowly at the end uh, to wash their hands and are much more relaxed, whereas if it's out-group, they rush over, scrub their hands, find it deeply aversive. Now, the important point here is what do all these things amount to? They amount to a capacity to co-act. They amount to an ability to work together. 
And if you layer together these two transformations, the fact that you have a cognitive shift so you share common perceptions and common goals and interests, and secondly, an ability to act together, you see that a shared social identity creates the possibilities, the conditions of co-action. People become an effective social unit. They align their efforts. They act together to achieve their aims in the goal, in the world. And what that leads to is a third transformation. A sense of empowerment, a sense of efficacy. And much of the joy of groups, the joy of crowds, is that sense of we are empowered to make our view of the world. Our notion of how things should be, our values, our beliefs, our interests, a reality in the world. So in many ways, I can summarise all that I've just said by saying that a group of people who share a common social identity are a source of social power. They are a world-making tool. And if you are in a position to shape that shared identity, to define those interests, those beliefs, those values on which people to act, you are in a position to wield that world-making tool. And so identity models of leadership, social identity of models of leadership, which together with colleagues such as Alex Haslam and Michael Plato and Nick Steffens, we've been working on for a number of years, start from the premise that effective leadership, leadership which influences, which mobilises people, is a form of social identity management. It's a means of creating a sense of shared identity between the leader and followers, a matter of defining identities such that the projects of the leader become the norms and the values of the followers. Effective leadership is not about telling you what to do. Effective leadership is about clarifying for us what we believe in and what is appropriate to do in a particular context. Let me be a little bit more specific and talk to three elements of leadership, all based on the notion that the skill of leadership is the skill of creating and defining identities in such a way as to bring the leader and the followers together in a common project, which is why we refer to leaders as entrepreneurs of identity. The first thing that a leader has to do is to show that they are part of the same group as the followers they seek to influence, that they are, if you like, of the people. They seek to make themselves prototypical. Well, the point about prototypicality is it's not typicality. It doesn't mean that you're ordinary or average. It means that you embody the characteristics which define us and make our group distinctive from other groups. They embody the values which define what it means to be Canadian or American or a Catholic or a liberal or whatever it might be. Prototypicality is not being ordinary, it's being extraordinary, extraordinary in representing the real us. The second is to show not only am I one of us, not only do I understand our values and our norms such that I'm able to understand what is important to us, what we value, what we want to do, it's also necessary to show that you are working for the people. Because one of the great paradoxes of leadership, of course, is leaders we often see as in and of themselves part of a separate category. They are leaders, they are politicians, they're not ordinary people like us. We're always suspicious of them, that they're acting for their interests, not our interests. They're acting for what's good for them, not what's good for us. And there are various examples in British po politics, for instance, a few years ago, a huge scandal about expenses, about members of parliament misusing expenses. And central to that was the notion of, it's not that they are on our side, you know, conservatives or Labour or Liberal Democrats. No, they're all the same. They're all politicians. They all have their snouts in the trough. And so the effective leader has to show, no, I'm not acting for myself. I don't want leadership in order to line my own pockets. I want leadership so I can act for us. 
But of course, it's not enough to use your efforts to act for the group. It is also necessary to provide to the people to be successful, to demonstrate that your actions bring to the group what they value, what is important to them. It's not just that they have success. It's not just that they win or they get legislation through or whatever. It's that what they get through embodies is the practical accomplishment of what the group values, of what's important to the group, of what we think is important. So there's a very brief outline of group process and of a leadership based on those group processes which is able to enthuse and which is able to mobilise people. And by now there is ample evidence to show that leaders who do exemplify these principles are highly effective, uh, that they are seen as more charismatic, that people even feel they have a close bond to such people. So what about going from leadership to toxic leadership? Now, if leadership is about defining who we are, then how democratic a leader is, is a function of the extent to which they involve or exclude the population in the process of defining the group. And I'm going to suggest three ideal types. One is genuinely egalitarian leadership, whereby the leader actually acts to facilitate a conversation, a national conversation, a conversation of the group, trying to say, what does it mean to be Scottish? What does it mean to be a Democrat or whatever? They don't claim to have special knowledge. They don't claim to be ahead of anyone else. Their role in leadership is as a facilitator. And there, everybody is equally involved. Everybody has equal voice in saying who we are, what counts for us, what we should do. More usually, I think, in, in, in certainly uh, in liberal democratic politics, is what we call hierarchical leadership, whereby the leader is not just one amongst equals. The leader claims special knowledge as to what it is to be us. The leader seeks to essentialise their version of what it means to be a member of the group by arguing that it's rooted in history, it's rooted in the environment or whatever. A number of years ago with Nick Hopkins we did research on uh, national identity in Scotland and you would find people arguing from the weather uh, you know, it's a hard country, it's a cold country, and so people have got to be self-reliant and entrepreneurial, a uh, very conservative version of what it meant to be Scottish. So hierarchical leadership is very much about a debate, but a debate in which the leader claims that their version of identity stands above all others. It still allows debate, doesn't outlaw debate. It still uh, acknowledges that others should have a voice, but the playing field is far from even. The playing field is very decisively tilted towards the political leader. But now let's take that one step further and talk about autocratic leadership. And autocratic leadership happens where the leader constitutes themselves, defines themselves as, if you like, the living embodiment of the category. I am America. I am Germany. I am whatever it might be. The individual in their body, in their history, in everything they do, is seen to be, as I say, an embodiment of the identity. And if the individual embodies the identity, then to oppose the leader is to go against the identity. It's define yourself as an outgroup member is to lose all influence. And once you monopolise identity, once you begin to say that what I say is what we believe, and you begin to say that anybody who disagrees with me is not of us, then the space for opposition begins to disappear. And uh, the space for autocracy begins to be occupied. 
let me try and put that point slightly differently. And incidentally, if you're wondering why that image is there, this is William Tyndale, who was killed uh, in England in the 15th century for trying to um, translate the Bible. Because by translating the Bible, of course, he allowed ordinary people to have a say in what it means to be a Christian, and therefore have a say in the way in which society in the country was run, and therefore fundamentally challenged uh, the power and the authority of clerics and absolute monarchs. To make claims on identity is a profoundly important political and psychological act. But as I say, let me take this uh, and put it in a slightly different way. In many ways, you could argue that everything turns on our attitude to difference. The whole Enlightenment project was about the notion that we are all members of a community. And that's through debate and talking to each other that we find out the best ways forward and that we progress in society. That your difference from me is actually something good for me because it's a means by which um, I can test my ideas and see if they work. But it's all dependent on seeing that we are part of a common community and that what you offer is in good faith and is genuinely intended to progress the society. So on the one hand, we have this classic enlightenment, liberal democratic notion that those who differ from us are still part of the same community. And that's through discussion with them that we move forward. Because everybody is trying to work out the best ways of moving forward together. That's central to the notion, for instance, of the loyal opposition, that they are there, in a sense, to test our policy and make sure we get things better. However, there is another notion of difference. And that is the notion of difference that those who differ with us are not part of a common community. They don't have the same interests as ours. Their views advance other interests which undermine our own interests. And therefore, debate with them is a means of undermining us. What they say is an attempt not to move forward a common community but to impose the values of one or another. So central to the possibility of democratic debate is the question, are those who differ from us of us and to be cherished? Are they not of us? Are they out group? And are they to be destroyed? And you can see how the two points I made in relationship to the last slide and to this slide are interlinked in the sense that the question of who speaks for the group and who is not of the group and speaks against the group is critical to the question of leadership and democracy. Our move is about replacing a failed and corrupt political establishment with a new government controlled by you, the American people. The establishment has trillions of dollars at stake in this election. For those who control the levers of power in Washington and for the global special interests, they partner with these people that don't have your good in mind. The political establishment that is trying to stop us is the same group responsible for our disastrous trade deals, massive illegal immigration, and economic and foreign policies that have bled our country dry. The political establishment has brought about the destruction of our factories and our jobs as they flee to Mexico, China, and other countries all around the world. It's a global power structure that is responsible for the economic decisions that have robbed our working class, stripped our country of its wealth, and put that money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and political entities. The only thing that can stop this corrupt machine is you. The only force strong enough to save our country is us. 
The only people brave enough to vote out this corrupt establishment is you, the American people. I'm doing this for the people and for the movement, and we will take back this country for you, and we will make America great again. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. So, having laid out some general principles of leadership and then of toxic leadership, we come to the question of Donald Trump and of Donald Trump's appeal. What you've just seen was Trump's argument for America, his final campaign pitch just before the election. And I think you will agree whether you like it or you don't like it. It is a fairly coherent and very powerful discourse. And what I want to do is to unpack it and show how it relates to the principles of leadership and the principles of toxic leadership. So let me start off. One of the reactions to Trump's victory was to pathologize his followers. To see them, in a term that became famous and in itself highly toxic, to see them as deplorable. To see them as racist and sexist or just plain stupid and not knowing what their own interests were. In recent work we've done um, looking at how people explain those who vote for the other side, we found that about two thirds of Democrat voters defined those who voted for Trump uh, as somehow defective. A far higher proportion, incidentally, than Trump supporters explaining why people voted for Clinton. And I want to argue that not only is this wrong, I want to argue it's highly counterproductive. It reinforces the very terms which make Trump successful. What Trump does is he theorizes decline. He takes a real experience, an experience of a critical section of the electorate who feel left behind, who feel that progress and enrichment has ignored them, that they are devalued both financially and in terms of status. They're not the very poorest, but they are the people who are in danger of slipping down, uh, of losing out of falling back towards the very poor. People talk about the Rust Belt. And the slogan, Make America Great Again, is premised on this notion of decline. This notion that a country that should be great, a country that uh, is fundamentally great, has lost its way and needs to recover it. This is a familiar discourse in American politics, often talked about as the American Jeremiah. Just to back that notion up, one quote, one analysis says one element common to a significant share of Trump supporters is they've largely missed out on the generation-long transition of the United States away from manufacturing and into a diverse, information-driven economy deeply intertwined with the rest of the world. But what Trump does is to acknowledge that decline and to theorise it. And in a context where his opponents ignore that decline or even claim that it doesn't exist, the very fact that he speaks to it gives him a decisive advantage. So how does he theorise it? The experience might be real. The sense of decline might be a real lived experience. But the way in which Trump theorises it, both in how he uh, diagnoses it and the cure is something very different. So his notion of the decline is not economic. It's not even political. It's based on the classic populist distinction between ordinary people and an elite establishment. There is an elite in the United States who've looked after themselves, who line their own pockets, who despise ordinary people, and they are at odds with the ordinary, decent, hard-working people of America. So 
his notion is that the reason for decline is due to an enemy within the establishment. But he links those also to an enemy without, those outside the country who are trying to do the country down, those uh, in other countries who are exploiting its trade, those who are coming in to uh, attack the country, whether they be uh, Muslims or South Americans or whatever. And he sees an integral link between the two. The establishment, as you saw in the video, are integrally linked to this external enemy. They're all part of one thing. And in fact, the establishment might have an interest in bringing in uh, migrants as their maids and their workers. So a construction, a basic construction of categories of ordinary people, and I will show that they are then represented by Trump, or at least Trump construes himself as representing them, against the establishment. And so, his solution is to attack, is to take down both the enemy without and the enemy within. You build walls to stop the enemy without coming in, until very recently you locked up uh, their children. And then on top of that, you attack the establishment. You take down the Washington Swamp. So a particular diagnosis, a particular theorization of the basis of this decline for ordinary people and a particular set of solutions. Now, how then does Trump define himself as a leader? You see, one paradox might seem to be, again, that if you argue that, uh, that Trump is successful because he represents the group, he is most unrepresentative of the group. He is an incredibly rich man who flies around in private airplanes, uh, who uh, lives in a tower served by a gold uh, lift. How can this man said to be representative? But here I come back to the notion of prototypical. And here we come back to, oh, the technology is working. So let's start off with of the people. This is from his website, Donald J. Trump is the very definition of the American success story. Continues setting the standards of excellence while expanding his interests in real estate, sports and entertainment. In other words, he represents the American dream. He's an ordinary guy who through his sheer get up and go and through his sheer verve has pulled himself up to the top. Yes, he's rich, but that exemplifies what makes America, America and what makes America unique. And he flaunts his wealth. He never dresses in, in, in jeans to be seen to be like you. No, he is always immaculately dressed in expensive suits and shoes and ties to exemplify his success as the American success story. He is representative of his notion of the decent, ordinary, hardworking people who can make it. And if they go with him, they will make it. For the people, one point he says, one of the big banks came to me and said, Donald, you don't have enough borrowings. Could we loan you four billion? And I said, I don't need it. I don't want it. And I've been there. I don't want it. In other words, his ever, uh, very wealth means that he's not in hock to the money men. He isn't like his opponents, like Hillary Clinton, as he claims, in hock to Wall Street. He isn't acting for outside interests. He's one of the money men himself. He's rich enough not to care about those, those sorts of things. He's incorruptible, so he claims. And therefore, he is able to act for the people. And to the people, he also claims his skills will allow him to make America great again, to recover that notion of a particular America with a particular sense of itself and a particular sense of power. Our country is in serious trouble. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't, we don't have them. When was the last time anyone saw us beating, let's say, China in a trade deal? They kill us. I beat China all the time, all the time. This is the man of the art of the deal. This is the quintessential deal doer. This is the man who won't only work for us, but can deliver for us. Now, I'm not saying these things are true. In fact, it's been estimated that uh, if uh, Donald Trump had done no deals at all and simply put his money in the stock market, he'd have three times as much money as he has now. But that's not the point. The point is his ability to construe a particular version of himself 
as a champion of the ordinary people. And that's why many of the things which people thought would destroy him, his crudeness, his use of sexual innuendo, his boasting about uh, you know, the large size of his appendages and so on, far from damaging him, exemplified the fact he's not an ordinary politician, he's not a smooth operator, he's a rough and ready guy. He's like you and I, he sometimes says it badly, he sometimes can be a bit crude, but the map makes him more of the ordinary people, the guy from the rough side of the tracks who made it to the very, very top. And in fact, just today, I was looking at the newspaper, I opened the newspaper, and yesterday, when, you Trump, uh, when Trump did his U-turn on locking up um, children uh, of immigrants, um, he made a speech in Minnesota, and as part of the speech he says, why are they the elite? I have a much better apartment than they do. I'm smarter than they are. I'm richer than they are. I became president and they didn't. And I'm representing the greatest, smartest, most loyal, best people on earth, the deplorables. Again, this construction of the establishment versus ordinary people. And ordinary people, not in terms of being rich, but in terms of being hardworking, in terms of being able to be successful. He is representative of them, not divided from them by his riches, by his millions. And everybody knows what I'm talking about. And this crooked media, if you talk about crooked Hillary, they're worse than she is. Now, I introduced that video to make a further point about the way in which Donald Trump is so successful at creating a sense of himself as the representative of the people who works for and achieves for the people. That he doesn't just do it in words, he performs the identity. And his rallies, uh, as Roger Stone says in his book on the making of the, the, the president, is utterly critical. These rallies are right at the center of the Trump appeal and the Trump campaign. Because what they do is they perform the identity. They're like morality plays which bring alive his construction of us and them and where he stands. So let me describe a Trump rally to those of you who uh, haven't been to one or don't know about them. About an hour or so, before Trump comes on stage, big, burly security men come and stand close in front of the audience and stare at them. And their very presence denotes danger. It's saying we have to have this security because there are people who might disrupt this. There are protesters. There are enemies without who might come in and disrupt. And so we need to see whether they're there or not. And so this notion of the enemy without is invoked. And if anybody is spotted, either protesting or even not being enthusiastic enough, not cheering and not clapping, because of course one of the things this does is to create no space for neutrality. If you're not with us, you're against us. You have to be seen to be with us. But if anybody is spotted who is uh, a potential protester, then the crowd is told not to attack them, but to point at them and to chant Trump, 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 Trump. So you collectivize to the whole crowd 
the notion that the enemy without is present, and Trump is invoked as, if you like, the antidote to this enemy without. And then finally, Trump comes on stage, and one of the first things he often does, or often did, is to make use of these protesters, to identify them, to encourage their expulsion, often their violent expulsion. Trump's appearance destroys the enemy without. But then he does something else, which you saw on the video. He gets the crowd to turn on the liberal establishment represented by the media. In most of his rallies, the media was penned in just behind him, and he would turn and point to them, and the crowd would bay at them and silence them. For once in their lives, it wasn't the voice of the media that spoke about them and silenced them and they couldn't answer back. Now, in a Trump rally, you become powerful. And through the agency of Trump, you expel the enemy without and you vanquish the enemy within. For once, your voice is heard and theirs isn't. And there are various accounts of uh, journalists in these rallies, uh, feeling uh, shamefaced, sh staring at their feet, feeling they can say nothing. A remarkable inversion. So the Trump rally is a really powerful means of enacting and bringing alive this notion of America, giving a people a sense of empowerment, creating within the space of the Trump campaign what Trump claims to achieve more generally in the world, which is you will be empowered to defeat your enemies. It makes that notion not just a verbal claim, but a lived and experienced reality. And you see again the sense of power and the sense of joy that people get from such a sense of being in control of their own fate, what we call collective self-realisation. So Trump is incredibly powerful and incredibly accomplished as an entrepreneur of identity. And I think it's important to look at and to understand his action in those terms, to ask when he does various things which seem to violate all the rules of politics and all the rules of international diplomacy, what is he trying to do? Is he trying to solve the Middle East problem? Is he trying to deal with issues of world trade? Or is he speaking to his base, saying, look, see, I break all the rules, but I am like you, and I act for you, and I'm effective in terms of what you care about. Let me just make one final point. In what, then, does the toxicity of Donald Trump lie? I've talked about his effectiveness. I've tried to show what a skilled entrepreneur of identity he is. But what about his toxicity? Now, in many ways, you might point to the toxicity of his particular policies. The ban on people coming into country. The jailing of young infants and their separation from their parents. Many other examples besides. I want to argue there is a more basic toxicity, which is at the root not only of their, those policies, but the difficulty of challenging them. And that is precisely that Donald Trump positions himself as, if you like, the embodiment of ordinary Americans. That they might not be able to do things for themselves, but he does things for them. He is their agency, as we see in the rallies. And also rhetorically, that anybody who disagrees with Donald Trump is cast as outside the national community. You can't disagree with Trump and still be seen as an American. If you take a legal judgment against him, you become a Mexican. If you uh, are not born elsewhere and you disagree with him, then you are acting against the national interest. You are, in a sense, by what you do rather than by where you were born, uh, act against the country. The most obvious aspect of this is his behaviour towards Hillary Clinton. Clinton is not treated as an adversary with whom he's debating about what is good for America. She is treated as an enemy of America, as anti-American, as somebody who should be taken out of American society and the American community and locked up. And again, in the rally that Trump had in Minnesota yesterday, for me, last week, for you, 
He says, well, at least this is a report. As Trump asked, how guilty is she? The crowd chanted, lock her up. This notion that your opponents are somehow outside of the community, outside of society, is critical. And of course, he doesn't just say this about Clinton, more generally of the Democrats. He says they put illegal immigrants before American citizens. They are anti-national. You don't listen to them because they're not asking what's good for the American community. You start by dismissing them. And to the extent that what Trump does is to treat difference as something which is unacceptable, that anybody who differs from him is un-American and outside the community, that anybody who differs from him must be obliterated rather than engaged with, therein lies the real toxicity, the real authoritarianism of Donald Trump. So let me conclude. And my conclusions are simple. The first point is to understand the power and the techniques of identity entrepreneurship. And in part, the reason why we're in this mess is that Hillary didn't. Donald did. Second, the nature of any group or organisation, or indeed society, is encapsulated in the question of who gets to define the group identity? Who gets to say who we are? Because that is what gives them power. That's what allows them to control the social power which comes from the social group. And finally, the surest sign of toxicity, the point at which we need to begin to be concerned, take action, perhaps not quite yet run for the hills, but certainly be worried, the surest sign of toxicity is where the difference is embraced or difference is obliterated. And the problem of our times is increasingly difference is not embraced. Debate is excluded. Those who disagree are positioned as enemies and obliterated. And with that, I finish my talk. Again, I'm very sorry I can't be uh, in Montreal with you to discuss these issues, but if anything in what I've said is of interest, if you want anything expanded on, just want a conversation, then do feel free um, to get in touch with me. And thank you very much indeed for listening.